All right. Well, thank you all for coming to our fifth monthly town hall forum. Uh, my name is Marcus. I'm using this microphone for the people on Zoom, right? The people here can hear me all right, but uh, the microphone's what's sending it over the computer. So uh, just be aware of that. And you guys will have that microphone for your table and we'll have this one over here for our table come panel time. Um, but first I want to uh, start off by saying thank you to our speakers. Um, you'll hear plenty from them here shortly, but I, I do wanna say thank you. I appreciate your time coming out here and sharing with the community. Our volunteer staff, our attendees, both online, Zoom, Facebook, and in person, as well as the community for, uh, for responding to what we're doing, and Parkville Presbyterian Church for um, hosting us in, their, in the building. Also, our donors who make this possible, we really appreciate you. Parkville Living Center is in the privately, uh, I'm sorry, individually donor funded, so um, we wouldn't be here without your guys' support, and so we really appreciate that as well. I just wanna start off by taking one moment to remember our ancestors, those who came before us and the future generations who will call us their ancestors. So hopefully that uh, gets us set for an honest and thoughtful conversation. Um, the ground rules for the town hall forum is that we have three 15 minute presentations from our speakers, and then we open it up for a, for a 15 to 20 minute question and answer session. Uh, in the past, that's been done via breakout room, but today we're going to do a panel question and answer. So um, everybody will get to hear from everybody and hopes that we maybe hear something that we weren't expecting to hear that really sits and resonates with us. So that's the goal here is to uh, have that honest, thoughtful conversation that spills out into the community that gives common language to some of the amazing things that are happening here in Parkville and beyond. And so now I'd like to open it up with Alicia Ellingsworth from the Kansas City Farm School at Gibbs Road. I wanna talk about something that we don't necessarily talk about or think about very much. A couple of things, um, hope and possibility. And I wanna be bold and say, I know where those two things live. And they're not far. About 10 miles south on 635 is a farm called Casey Farm School at Gibbs Road. And on this farm, we invite the community. We bring the community on farm hands-on and we teach people how to grow food. We grow food and we teach them how to grow food. Um, we imagine the farm as the center of its community, a place where collaborative, intergenerational, participatory food projects happen. And it's a pretty powerful thing teaching people how to grow food. Uh, we teach four-year-olds um, through a program called Ag Explorers. So every Saturday for a month, so four Saturdays, four to eight-year-olds come with their adult and they do some art and they do some ag. We meet right around the chicken yard. And the first thing that we do is remember what it feels like to be a chicken. <laughs> we think about how a chicken wants us to enter their yard. And we talk about how, well, chickens probably feel the same way we feel when we go, when people come to our house, we want them to be polite and kind, not chase us, not yell, not scream. So we try to embody that. Like we try and look at chickens the same way that we look at ourselves. And um, it's magical, right? In the first, the first Saturday, the kids are quiet and gentle and walk into the chicken yard, hold their hands out and chickens are eating out of their hands. And then um, it's the adults we have to train a little bit because as we are trying to fill up the duck pond um, and carry these five gallon buckets of water, um, the parents wanna pick up those waters. I slow the parents down and that's not why we're here is to get the job done. We're here so that the kids, right, can have that experience and have that hope that they too make a difference, right? Uh, nine to 14 year olds um, will start up junior growers camp on Monday. And we do that for 10 weeks throughout the summer. Um, these poor kids, I don't know if they know what they're in for, but they're gonna come to the farm, um, do some morning chores, um, harvest some items and cook together for their lunch, have some STEM, um, sit down time, and then some experiential art time. Um, Fish and Wildlife is gonna come on Friday and do some um, archery and 
different classes, pollinator classes and all about animals. Um, the kids are gonna help us set up and host our farmer's market every Wednesday. Uh, and we've hired two amazing people to um, be our camp counselors, two artists actually from Kansas City. So we're really excited to have that happen. Um, we are a host farm for the Growing Growers program. And that so young adults and sometimes uh, people who have retired and are looking for a second career, join a Growing Growers program. And it's a collaboration of K-State, MU, Lincoln Extension, Cultivate Kansas City, KC Food Hub. Um, and together we build this curriculum that's 10 months long. Um, there's hands-on work. So apprentices are on a host farm like ours. Um, there's sit down work with the host farm. And then there's community uh, workshops where they meet their peers and they grow the next generation of urban farmers who then will work together as the generation that I'm in have worked together. In the next few months, we'll be developing this program for those in between ages, 15 to 18 year olds, because we know as a 15 year old is looking for their first job, I wanna give them the opportunity for hope and possibility of having an option other than fast food or mowing lawns, right? If we can help them learn how to grow food and feel that satisfaction, then um, we are developing that right now. And then the community. Um, Growing out of the pandemic last year is a program called Let's Grow Wyandotte. Um, we always grow too many plants in our greenhouse. Jolene, you know how many plants we have in our greenhouse. And we always scramble late May to figure out where they go. Well, last year, the demand was huge. And we decided to start giving these, plant, these plants away in April instead of waiting until May. Overnight, 85 people signed up for this program that we really at that time didn't even know what it was. We knew we were gonna give plants away and we were gonna offer some kind of mentorship to the people who signed up. We did that, we worked it out, we teach people how to grow food, but we, we were surprised by that possibility. And I think even the hope that grew from that, the community that grew around the program, neighbors, talking to neighbors who had never spoken before. It was always kind of fun when we came together for a meeting on Zoom last year. Um, people would say, I saw a Let's Grow Wyandotte sign out in the wild, meaning, you know, we spotted one of our signs. There weren't, you know, there were 85 of them, so you didn't see them often. But um, this year we have about 115 people signed up. And one of the things that we saw, empowering the community to then ownership. So people who were involved last year have stepped up into uh, leadership positions in um, the program now. So one woman um, is recruiting her neighbors. Another person will be teaching all about uh, monarch, white, um, monarch way stations so that we can have even a bigger impact. They show up when, I, when, when things happen at the farm, when we need help. So we have helped people grow food and they have um, grown the community, uh, our community. Um, so we also grow food for sale. About 25% of our income is earned income. And so we have an on-farm market. Wednesdays, our grand opening is tomorrow from two to six. We'd love to see you. We also have a 45 member CSA and we're members of the Kansas City Food Hub, which is a cooperative association of 23 regional um, producers, vegetables and animals. Um, we're a medium-sized farm in the group. There are some smaller than us, and there's a half-acre farm in Northeast KCK, KC Mo, and then there's a couple of larger family farms um, in Richmond and down south in Rich Hill and El Dorado Springs. So all sizes, working together, stronger together. Um, we are in the habit of saying yes. Uh, one Saturday in April, I got a call from some collaborator some collaborators in KCK and they had been giving away those USDA food boxes all morning and somehow they had 200 left. They called and asked, can we help distribute these food? And I said, yes. And then we started figuring out how to do it. It took them about 15 minutes to get to the farm, but I had 10 people on the farm volunteering, picking up plants, um, people who just happened to stop by. And so we got together, we unloaded the truck, filled up our walk-in and the boxes kept coming. So we started taking the boxes up to the street and I would I flag down cars going by. About three cars drove by and knew I was a crazy person. But the other 150, you know, stopped and were thrilled and grateful like and went home with food for themselves. Many took a couple boxes and distributed to their neighbors. So 
we did that again last Saturday. We got the same call. It was raining. There were eight people with me on the farm. They brought about 80 boxes. So we were able to give away another several thousand dollars worth of food. We say yes. And things unfold, right? All of our food, all of our programming is always pay what you're able. We believe that everybody should have access to fresh, healthy, nutritious food. Everyone should have access to education that's going to change their life. And we believe that if we all share what we have, then everyone can have what they need. We see this over and over and over working. And I don't mean to make this sound easy. I don't mean to say that we're super funded or anything. In fact, we um, are pretty close on empty at the end of every month. But we are doing better than we did last year. We are doing better than we did in 2019. And the community that um, has grown around us is strong and we have faith in that. Never before have I stepped out into nothing and always put my foot down on solid ground. Um, we, are, we are that example. We wanna be that example of faith and of possibility and of hope. Um, we have a couple rules on the farm. One is that we say hello to everyone we meet. Um, everyone is invited. Everyone is needed. Um, we don't see that very often anymore. Um, I have a, a, a really clear memory um, last year. Um, I was in the greenhouse. It's a long place, right? And in the door walks a CSA member. So CSA is a, a partnership between a farmer and a individ, an individual, each looking to, you know, food, exchange food and money. We get the money out of the way and then the partnership list. So we feed these people every week for the summer and not even have to talk about money. So one of the CSA members was walking toward me. I could see that tears were streaming down her face. And as she got closer, I could see she had a smile across her face, tears streaming down her face, big smile on her face. And as she got closer, she was like shaking her head. So tears down her face, big smile, shaking her head. And she said, I just have to thank you. Thank you for having this place. Thank you for letting me come and volunteer here. Thank you for providing hope providing food, providing access to the community. And I'll tell you, this happens over and over and over again. When volunteers come, they work hard, right? There's no small jobs and people get busy. Um, we try to take care of them. We try to make them um, go away happy, but they come um, and, and thank us for that opportunity. So, um, we're invited. I mean, what else do we have to do in these times, right? Um, we know we know the bad stories. We know the lack. We know the suffering and the sickness. But we also know, and I have proof 10 miles down the road, that if you step forward into possibility with faith and invite others to join, anything is possible. Oh my goodness. That is, that was wonderful. That was so great. Thank you, Alicia. Um, <clears throat> one of the, one of the things I was running through my mind was how I've been working with Alicia on and off. I've been friends with her. I've been watching, walking alongside her with in life for, you know, a good number of years now. And, and I'm just always amazed at, at the ways that possibilities manifest themselves. And so, so thank you for doing that. And I'm really looking forward to the question and answer segment. Um, but to keep this show moving, we're going to introduce Julia Trumpold from Faux Paws. Hello, everyone. And um, you can tell I'm a teacher because I prepared a PowerPoint, <laughs> too. So I'm stepping aside a little bit. Um, maybe while we're waiting, um, something Alicia said with hope, I mean, we can take this over to, to my place, FOPAS, uh, where we work with the dogs and cats and um, we are a place of hope as well for yeah. them and um, also for the people who adopt the, the animals because it's not always the animals that are being rescued. I mean, they are being rescued, but they always rescue us back. Um, okay, my PowerPoint. So um, on you can see the picture that is our um, starting page on the website. So you can check it out. It's um, parkwellshelter.com. Pretty easy um, to find on the web. 
and as you can see, saving animals for over 20 years. I will give a little overview in a little bit. Um, so um, first of all, every picture or almost every picture has one of our adoptable pets. Um, this is Jordy. She's in the dog house. She's super sweet. <laughs> um, she always smiles. She loves to play with male dogs. Um, so if anyone is interested in them, they're all on our website. So, so a little bit about um, the history and the background. Um, so in Parkville, the animal control is one of the responsibilities of the police department. So there's not a um, specific animal control like in, in Kansas City. So the police officers pick up stray dogs um, and they, um, so people can find them, they bring them to us. So we hold them for five days. That is the holding period. If no one steps forward, that's when they become a faux pas dog. Um, so before 1998, um, dogs which were picked up by the police were housed in an open pen located next to the railroad tracks down by the park. Um, so city workers fed the dogs and cleaned the pens and that was usually once a day. I mean, they had other things to do as well. It was not like they were the, the animal control. So the pens were cold in the winter, hot in the summer. There were rats. Um, and if the city workers had other things to do, um, the dogs were left without care for a little bit. And I, I'm, I'm not trying to, to make that sound like uh, they're bad people. I mean, they are not hired to do this. So, but then in 1999 um, or in 1998, um, FOPAS was informally formed by a group of volunteers, um, citizens uh, in conjunction with other rescue groups to provide care for Parkville stray dogs. So they consisted of volunteers who offered their time to take to care for the dogs, to provide medical care when needed, and to work to get, get the dogs adopted. Um, so they didn't have a facility. So um, first, they continued to use the pens at the railroad tracks. Um, but they were supplemented with additional space um, at boarding facilities um, and foster homes. And um, we still use foster homes, which is one of the, the most important parts of, of our uh, mission actually. And um, they actually started to take in cats as well. Um, so the volunteers took upon themselves a significant burden caring for a variety of dogs twice a day, 365 days a year, rain or shine. And that's still the case. We're there Christmas, we're there 4th of July, uh, negative 10 degrees, 100 degrees, Rain, snow, it doesn't matter. The, the animals have to be taken care of. Um, so they also constantly work to find additional foster homes and to get the dogs adopted and to raise the money to allow them to carry these activities. And then in 1999, a donation and a modest grant from the city of Parkville allowed FOPAS to build a small wooden shed to house cats and kittens, also in English Landing Park by the railroad tracks. And then in 1999, also FOPAS obtained the license from the state of Missouri to be an animal shelter. So that's what, what we call our founding year is 1999. So uh, we had our 20th anniversary in, in 2019. Um, so in 2000, uh, the Friends of Parkville Animal Shelter was incorporated as a nonprofit corporation in Missouri. So we are tax exempt. Um, and then from 1999 through October of 2006, FOPAS continued to work under the challenging conditions of the outdoor pens, foster homes, limited number of places in boarding facilities for dogs, which were paid by FOPAS, and then the, the small wooden shed for the cats. But then in October 2006, um, through the generosity of Pat and Judy Kelly, FOPAS was able to move into former commercial building and residence uh, at 1356 State Highway 9, which is down in between, kind of between the two um, cemeteries, right by the entrance of Wrist Lake, where we're still uh, today. So the, um, the commercial building was uh, retrofitted with 15 inside kennels for the dogs, and in addition, a few outdoor only kennels, and then the residence was altered to a cat house, and we still have that today. Um, and in 2007, FOPAS entered into an agreement with the city of Parkville, whereby FOPAS would, for a fee, take and, take and assume a responsibility for almost all stray dogs picked up by Parkville police within the city limits. Which means if someone finds a dog within Parkville, 
they, they can come to us directly, but we will have to call a police officer down so he can do the intake. And then um, people, when they pick up their dog, hopefully, uh, they will also have to go through the police to get the dog released. And it's their discretion if, if a ticket is being issued or not. And um, if the dog is not being picked up within five days, it becomes officially a faux pas dog. And we uh, take responsibility and try to find a home for them. Um, so, but in addition to dogs from Parkville, we also um, work with the county of Platte County, um, which the animal control is, or the, the stray dogs go to Jackson Animal Clinic in Platte City. And when their time is up there, that's when, when we take them from there. And we can, the next one. So our mission, and this is, I need to look at, look, I wrote down the names because I don't know the cats. This is Altus. <laughs> he actually has a, um, uh, a part in the, in the weekly newsletter, it Ask Altus, and uh, it's like a, so this is our mission. So we wanna provide a safe, clean shelter for abandoned dogs and cats, medical care as needed, spay, neuter, vaccinations, treat worms, treatments for medical conditions, well, you can, you can read it yourself. So this is take care of the animals and find home for, homes for them is, is, is what we're striving to do. Okay, we can go to the next one. All right, so how is FOPA's finance? This is Shelby in a foster home, having a blast. Um, so we are financed through financial donations, memorials. So when, when people pass away, instead of flowers, they sometimes say, we wanna uh, donate money to FOPA's. Then birthday fundraisers, um, especially on Facebook, um, are very popular lately because it's really easy to create a um, Facebook fundraiser. Um, or just donations when, when, whenever people want to donate. Then, of course, um, also donations of food, sheets, towels, treats. Um, we have a list on the website of what things we need. Um, cleaning supplies. I mean, it's not just dog-related stuff. Um, and sometimes people don't think about that we, we clean as well. So um, stuff like that. Then um, we have fundraisers. Um, our biggest one used to be Paws in the Park. Um, we were not able to do that the last couple of years, first because of flooding in the park. And then obviously last year um, we couldn't do it because of COVID. Um, then we have a lot, a lot of yard sales. We, we do those during the summer. Uh, usually we have three or four um, at the residence right next to the uh, animal shelter, also on Highway 9. Then we have a fundraiser, it's called Chocolate for Paws. Um, people bake a lot of goodies and uh, you get a ticket and then it's basically all you can eat. There's raffles and stuff. It's always fun. Uh, with, with COVID, we have started online auctions on Facebook where people um, make like baskets, donate gift certificates, stuff like that. And, and you can um, bid and then the highest bidders wins and um, get to pick up their prize. And then we have FOPA's Fabulous Finds, um, which is uh, a store that sells uh, gently used items, no clothing and um, furniture, accessories, dishes, books. And um, that's down um, uh, on East Street, right next to Samsara, right before the uh, railroad tracks. So, and we're open only um, Fridays and Saturdays because we're all volunteer based. And then that started in April of 2014. And of course, as I mentioned, we have the contract with the city of Parkville who give us a, um, a fee for, for the dogs that we take in uh, for them. Okay, and we have an upcoming fundraiser actually, June 12th to the 26th. And um, we have um, artists that have volunteered and if there are artists out there who wanna contribute, um, you can email um, friendsofparkwellanimals uh, at gmail.com and say you're an artist you would like to participate. If you're not like me, I'm not an artist, but you can also send in your picture and then one of the artists will paint your cat or dog. And um, as I said, it starts on June 12th. 
and uh, you can find all the information on our on our website. Okay, and this is I need to look Sia, very cute. Um, so volunteering, what what do we do? Um, it's cleaning the cats or the dogs. With cleaning, it's meaning the kennels, not the animals themselves. Although we we do that sometimes as well. Then walking the dogs. Um, Hope us fabulous finds, um, help with fundraisers. We have a lady who does laundry for us, which is super nice. Um, people can organize personal fundraisers, like little kids, um, sometimes like one for their birth birthday stuff for the animal shelter. So all their relatives bring, bring stuff and then they come to the shelter and donate it and they get to meet a dog or a cat. Um, or um, some companies um, have like a work day and we've had companies like, like banks and, um, and they just come and then they mulch our yards and weed. And so those are all things. If, if people can't volunteer on a regular basis, um, that would be something you can do. And who are all our volunteers? They're from all parts of life. Um, we have a lot of retired people right now um, because they have the most time, obviously. Then um, I'm a teacher. Um, I teach college. So my time is very, like in the summer, right now I'm off. So I can spend a lot of time at the, at the shelter. Um, but we have students. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's all kinds of people. And um, young people, you have to be 12 to, to volunteer at the cat house and 14 with the dogs. And until you're 17, uh, a parent or guardian has to, to be there with them. It's just, it's a safety issue. Um, so, yeah. This is Bear. He's a, a Great Pyrenees mix. So at the doghouse, what do we do? Um, the morning shifts are from six to eight. Well, the walkers get there at six. I'm one of the walkers twice a week, but the actual lead on that day, they get there at 445. They do that six times a week. Yes. Yes. Shout out to Kathy Baker and uh, Becky Weaver every day, 445. Um, and then cleaning, hosing the outside pens, um, the dogs play in the yards. And then when the walkers get there, we walk them. And in the mornings, we actually do leave the property and walk them down to the pack center. There's a little pond behind it, which is a nice area. In the afternoons, we do not leave the shelter because as you can see, 2.30 to 5.30, it's kind of like when a lot of traffic is on Highway 9. So we have a little trail behind the shelter and that's where, where the dogs walk then. And so the afternoon shifts are 2.30 to 5.30. Um, and again, same as in the mornings. Let's check out the cat house. And this is Mr. Banks. They dress him up nicely. <laughs> I chose the ones that were, that were fun. <laughs> um, the morning shifts are 7.30 to 8.30. Um, the volunteers are assigned one room. So it's, it's a little different than at the dog house. You can just go there whenever because um, there's no, no lead or something. Everyone has a, they, they have a, a code at the door. So everyone has a code and um, depending on experience and comfort level, they have one room or several rooms that they clean the, the kennels or the cages and play with the cats. And then the afternoon shift is 4.30 to 5.30 or six. So again, it's, they come at five, 5.30, it doesn't matter. The, the dogs are more restricted. <laughs> and do I have another slide? Okay, that's the last one. So it's so much fun volunteering with faux pas. I mean, I've been doing, doing that since 2007. I mean, there are people who've been there much longer than I have. So it's, it, it becomes an addiction almost. And um, you can have a bad day and you're, you're driving there and you're like, oh my God, I have to go there, but you do it. And then you see Jordy or you see Bear and it's like, yep, that's why I do this. And a couple of weeks ago, no, it was last Wednesday, we got drenched. It was this, this downpour came down at like right at 3.30 <laughs> and we had all the yards filled. So we were, we were sprinting. I mean, we were wet to the point where you can't get any more wet, <laughs> but it's, 
it's what you do. Sometimes I'm like, I wish I volunteered at the cat house because they're inside, <laughs> right? So they have air conditioning in there. They, they're dry, but it's, it's so much fun. It's so much fun. So thank you. Thank you. Awesome. That was great. Uh, I have a slight experience with the faux pas because uh, my dog has ran off a couple times and <laughs> And I know that the police get involved and we got to get involved. And luckily I haven't had any tickets issued yet, um, but I think we got it under control. And I love it when um, I was talking with the people at the faux pas, they, they knew my dog, they knew Taylor. They knew Taylor, yeah. So, um, so great people, great organization. Again, looking forward to the questions and answers. Um, but to keep this moving, I want to introduce Bonnie Smith. And uh, yeah, I'll turn it over to her. Okay, thank you, Marcus. And uh, at this point, I bet there's nobody left online because they are now looking at kitty pictures and puppy videos, and <laughs> which is what I love to do when I'm not playing with my own pets or growing my own food. Um, so I'm just going to speak for a bit um, about another um, aspect of our society that's kind of vulnerable. And, and you brought up, Marcus, at the very beginning, the moment for us to remember our ancestors. And America, in all of its greatness, has a couple of things that make growing older here a little difficult. Uh, one of those is we are very independent. We celebrate it every July 4th. Dang it, we're independent, and we're going to live in our house until we die because we're so independent. And then the second thing is that our families, of course, are kind of moving further away and not necessarily sharing homes and space with our elders anymore, like they're, uh, like is most common in some other cultures around the globe. So that leaves us with a bit of a dilemma sometimes. Um, if you're watching at home, or for those of you who are in the room, um, whether it be your own parents or your grandparents, maybe a neighbor, maybe somebody you see at church, um, maybe somebody who you just see at the grocery store and you realize they're elderly and they're alone. And who is it who's watching out for them, who's caring for them and just keeping an eye on them to see that they're, if they are vulnerable, that they have somebody who's kind of got their back. So my first thing for you, uh, I, I'm just going to ask for you to just, you know, keep your eyes open and just connect with these people. If nothing else, just smile, ask them how they're doing, let them tell a story or ask them, uh, just give them that dignity, please. Um, and then secondly, what I'm really here about is to help those of you who are caregivers or who may be on the verge of being a caregiver, whether it be a, a spouse or a parent or a grandparent, um, sometimes it becomes very difficult to know um, as a caregiver um, if there's gaps in security, you get you're so close to the situation that you don't really know where there may be some dangers or, or safety gaps that exist. So I'm just going to kind of go through the five major challenges of growing older at home and some of the resources that are out there to help you or help you identify if um, if things if you might need a little bit of help. And if you do have any questions, I know we're going to have the panel afterwards, but I understand and appreciate many of the questions some of you might have could be personal or pertaining to a specific situation. I'm always happy to answer questions whether or not um, I can assist you personally or connect you to somebody else who can assist you. That's my role. Just connect you, okay? So the five major things of caregivers. The, the first thing is medications. That is a real situation in our society where there are a lot of drug takers. Now, um, those who are over, it says the studies say that elders or seniors, that the average is more than five drugs per day. Now, remember, this is not talking like hippies and, you know, because you can be 65 and older <laughs> and your drug of choice might be gummy bears and brownies. I'm not talking about that. So, um, you know, whether it be for cholesterol, for blood pressure, for depression and anxiety, that's a huge medication in the United States right now. Um, are, the average is more than five medications a day. And as they get older, as people get older, it can be somewhat difficult to remember 
what if I've taken my medications, which medications I've taken, do they even remember why they're taking them? They may have been taking a medication for 20 years and they're just kind of popping it like a vitamin. They've forgotten why they're even taking it. Um, and so if the medic about maybe one in um, five, one in four, one in five people who are hospitalized as elders are hospitalized because of medication errors. Either they've taken them incorrectly or they have not taken them. They've neglected to take them. So that's close to 20% of hospitalizations caused by uh, drug interactions or, or, or not taking them. So there are some really easy steps if you are a caregiver or close enough, you know, just keep an eye on what that person needs. Keep a list of them, even if they're not in your home, even if they're you know, living in St. Paul, Minnesota, at some point, get a list of the medications that they're taking and know why they're taking them, how frequently, how long ago they were prescribed, and what kind of drug indications they you know, side effects you can, can watch out for. If it gets to the point that they're really not able to manage on their own, please be delicate with them, but step in to say, you know what, let me help you with this. Sometimes people, it's their vision. They may have macular degeneration and they just can't even see what they're doing. You'd be doing them uh, a huge favor by just offering to, you know, come in once a week and just do the pillbox for them, just fill it for them and, and make sure that would allow you to see each week if, if the medications are being taken as they should be or if they're skipping uh, medications. Um, the second is nutrition and fitness. Uh, most people, even before they're senior citizens, most people in America are not exercising enough anymore. But it becomes so important as an elder to maintain exercise so you've got your core strength, um, so you're not falling, you maintain your balance. Um, also very helpful for, well, for all of us to prevent depression and anxiety by having that outlet. Now in Parkville, there are some amazing resources right here. I mean, first of all, it's a beautiful place to just get outside of the house and walk, you know, but you've got the, uh, the Parkville y, or the YMCA and the Athletic Center and the Silver Sneakers is a free program offered through many of the Medicare plans, not all of them, but that's at the, at the YMCA where silver sneakers, you go in and you get to participate in classes and you get educational classes, you get points and prizes, you get camaraderie because there are a lot of other people who are there doing the same thing. So it's a wonderful resource, the, the YMCA. Um, and then as far as nutrition, um, gosh, a, a lot of elders are only eating one meal a day. They're eating very poor. They're, they're eating all the foods they told us never to eat when they were raising <laughs> us, right? Sugar becomes very high on their scale because it's something they can still taste. Um, so nutrition becomes very difficult for them. Um, of course, there are some wonderful programs such as Meals on Wheels, which in Platte County is uh, sponsored through the Mid-America Regional Council. And they, I think Platte County Senior Center um, delivers the meals. In this county, they deliver them, I believe they deliver them frozen here, like two weeks at a time. And so, along with some produce and some fresh things as well. But the hot meals, they have to, they'll have to reheat. Um, but if, if you are a caregiver and you're going, or a, a neighbor or friend and going in and noticing, um, if you open the refrigerator and it may be stacked up with a few things that are like expired in 2014, um, that, that does really, it becomes a reality a lot of times. I know my in-laws, you'd open their refrigerator, first of all, I think it was from 1949. It was actually rounded, you know, the, the ice wasn't in the bottom, but you'd open it up and you couldn't, I mean, there was no room to put anything else in it. And you start to take it out. It's like, oh my gosh, some of this stuff literally was a couple of years old. So um, keeping an eye on make, food safety is significant too. Um, you know, so what can you do? Oh, that's easy. You can grow it yourself. <laughs> um, you know, just make some extra meal. When you're making your meals, make some extra. Take it over to them. Uh, even better, offer to take, well, I was going to say take them out to a restaurant, although these days with COVID, that's been a little bit more um, pick, up a, pick up a meal and take it to their house or, or invite them to your house. But um, keep an eye on their nutrition um, and um, also their hydration. Drinking water every day is really important because if they're not hydrated, um, or if we're not hydrated, this is for everybody, we can kind of feel confused and very cloudy minded and maybe forget to take our medications. So.
Um, the third thing, of course, home safety. And that pertains to things like um, clutter in the house that makes it difficult for them to walk around. Those beautiful throw rugs that maybe they had crocheted or hand done and you know they've had in their house for years become very, very hazardous. So it's time to, uh, to roll those things up and give them away to somebody else in the family who would appreciate it. And um, if they're going to get rugs, make sure that they've got the, the nice backing behind that's kind of adhesive and keeps it on the floor and slow to the ground. Lighting, make sure that there's good lighting, especially in the steps. If they're, if they're still going up and down steps, make sure they're well lit. Um, you know, just the common sense things outside, like with the sidewalks, if they're, you know, going up and down their sidewalk, that sort of thing. Um, of course, falls in the home are one of the major reasons uh, people end up in the hospital. And um, a fall can change a life drastically. It might be, you know, one broken hip that leads to all kinds of complications. And um, so anyway, home safety is, is pretty significant. Uh, the isolation of being home alone. More than 10 million Americans over the age of 65 live alone. And when you think of this past year of COVID, what that could have done to them um, you know, it's been a challenge for everybody, but uh, uh, that isolation, you know, we're humans are created to connect. We're meant to connect with one another. And, and if they can volunteer, if you can, if they're still able to get out of their house and volunteer, even if they need transportation, uh, you know, working at the farm or working with the animals or uh, there's so many wonderful opportunities uh, to volunteer. Now also the senior center. So Platte County Senior Center and the Northland Shepherd Center, which is in Clay County, but serves the entire Northland. Both have some um, great opportunities for volunteering and also for programs, for uh, learning programs and, and uh, ways for people to get together and connect. And then finally, um, just planning. People don't plan uh, what they're gonna do when they have to move their house or from their home. They, you know, they're gonna live there forever, they think. So if, um, if you are a child or a, a relative of an elder, please do them your, the favor and yourself the favor of just taking some time and gently finding out what they want to do. I mean, first of all, do they have a health care directive? If they're in the hospital and something ha needs to be done, do they have somebody who can take care of that? Uh, secondly, financially, how are they managing? And do they need to have somebody, an administrator or a DPOA or somebody set up to, to assist them? And when it comes to, if it comes to the time where they need to leave their home, the options are going to depend greatly upon um, the family situation, about their financial situation. Um, but there are all kinds of folks, uh, myself and many, many others, who know, know the places, know what's affordable or what resources are available to help them. And so it's just a matter of reaching out and connecting. So that's it. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, yeah, I can see how those how the questions probably get personal and 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 deep really fast. So, um, so knowing, you know, that we can reach out to you, we'll have your email address available Super. for on our links and, um, and you've shared some amazing resources that that people can follow up on and, and really um, understand that at the core, I think, is relationship, right. Yes. And, and, and so taking the steps to do that, sometimes I know for me is out of my comfort zone, but I think uh, the growth that happens is, is well worth it. And so I appreciate you sharing that. Um, so we're going to transition now to the panel of, I'm sorry, the question and answer section. So I'm gonna move this microphone over here to this table. And um, what we'll do now is see if there are any questions online. Um, there are none. Yeah, there are some online, and then then we'll open it up to our in-person participants. And I've got a few few questions myself. So, um, what's one of the questions we got online? Well, actually, no, it's not a question, but a thank you. Oh, a thank you. Greg Smith says, "Thank you so much for three really excellent speakers and presentations, thank you, and the information and thanks 
for these great community advocates. Great community advocates and that appreciation coming from Greg. Thank you, Greg. And uh, and we'll, we, spread the, we spread your appreciation to this panel as well. Darla Dodds has a question. She says, how does the need for food change from one year ago? Are the food pantries still in great need? Okay, just to make sure the microphone got that, the question was, how has food changed? The need for food the, changed. How has the need for food changed in the past year? And are food pantries still in great need? And are food pantries still in great need? I believe this is for Alicia, so we'll, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I just heard last week that the USDA boxes that were a staple all last year through COVID and really excited a lot of people. The demand for them has gone down over the last couple of months, so that was seen as a, a sign that people perhaps may be more stable than they were this time last year or six months ago. Um, our farmers' market has picked up, so I guess I'm hopeful that the changes or some of the changes that were implemented last year, like searching for food more locally, uh, people are keeping those habits up. And I hear that the turnout at farmers markets as well are um, people, the numbers are up again. So maybe the resiliency of the community is back. We kind of add to something that um, I know that the senior centers, both Northland Shepherd Center and the Platt uh, County Senior Center, they have been getting program boxes as well through some local means, but they've been doing all the babies, the same government box. I'm not sure, but it's local food, it's produce. And um, they typically, in the last few weeks, I think, have had, they've been really stretching and calling people to come in and get them and find more people. So if you know of somebody who needs food, please call one of those voices. And where are those places? Well, this is the Northland Shepherd Center and the Platt County Seniors. Now, I'm not sure in terms of, for those who are not elderly, um, what the situation is for, for them for their group so. Yeah. Sure, and we can add something else. Um, at farmer's markets, most farmer's markets these days do take SNAP benefits. So um, I, we don't want to make it sound like everyone has enough food. There are plenty of people who are still access. So most farmers market, Parkville farmers market takes um, SNAP. And the secret I think that a lot of people don't know yet is that there's a wonderful um, match, a local match to those federal food stamp money, money called Double Up Food Bucks. Mid-America region of Council and Copenhagen City work together to provide that match. So when someone who's using SNAP, who's using food stamps, comes to a farmers market, swipes their card, instead of getting $20 at the end, but they actually get forty dollars, and so that they can quite the spending power. So that information I don't think is widely known. So please, if you um, if you talk to people who are using SNAP, please let them know that. That will let them know. All right. Oh yes, and and there, for for anybody in the north in the region. Actually, during COVID, it's been ex extended to the region. I'm not sure for how long, but um, the Speak Food Pantry that's located here in Parkville um, provides food to, to hundreds of people here in the Northland. And, um, and I know they have lowered their, they're giving away more food than ever. That's what I mean to say. So um, if, if you are in need, this food, the Speak Food Pantry is one of those resources for all ages across the board. Uh, the phone number for speak is 816-746-1057. All right. Is there another question on the online yeah. chat? Can people sign up to volunteer to walk dogs on an irregular basis? <laughs> and the question was, can people sign up to walk dogs on an irregular basis? The short answer is no. The thing is, um, because we're all volunteers and uh, we need to know how many people we have each week, of course, things come up. Um, people go on vacation, especially now in the summer, but um, and it's also a, a, a safety issue. We want people to get to know the dogs. Um, and if they only come like 
once every four weeks, it's just, it's just not enough. And unfortunately, I wish I could say it was possible, but it needs to be a, a commitment, a weekly commitment. Um, most people do so, a couple of times a week, but we always suggest to start with one time a week, like Tuesday afternoons, a couple of hours. And um, if people like it a lot, they can add a second, second shift, but it, it really, it needs to be a weekly commitment. It c cannot be irregular. Now, is that, does that go for the cats as well? I think so, yes. Okay. Because they need to know, because as I said earlier, the cats have the rooms assigned. So if someone only can come every three weeks, how, how do you assign a room to that person? Mm -hmm. And they don't know the cats at then. And so it, again, it needs to be a weekly commitment as well. So <laughs> that's right. I did. I saw laundry on there as one of the volunteer and I wasn't sure if that was for the pets or for the oh, it's towels. The towels. <laughs> the towels. It's the wardrobe, right? No, but uh, I did see there was plenty of uh, one-off volunteer opportunities for yes. those, for, for, for coming in. Like uh, Faux Pas Fabulous Finds, for example, if you only can volunteer like once a month, that is a place um, where that is possible. Um, because there's no animal interaction. So um, that would be something people could do if they can't volunteer on a weekly basis. Um, again, the laundry thing, um, just stop by whenever you have time and pick up a bag that's in front of the doghouse. Much appreciate it. And it's the the towels and sheets, yes. <laughs> that wardrobe. <laughs> um, and I can imagine the uh, seeing the wide range of um, fundraisers you guys hold the, the, the talents and skills of the community are are converted into value for the faux pas. Mm -hmm. Instead of volunteer hours, it's a craft or painting or cooking that I saw. Yeah. And that's a, that's yeah, so, a wonderful So Maria, way. who's organizing the, the, the artist one, she, she used to be an artist for Hallmark. So she's she has that artist background. So we all have our different talents that, that we bring to the table. Um, so yeah, but unfortunately, no. All right. Any online? Any other online questions? No, but I have a question. All right. Here. How about we just give you the mic? So um, about spaying and neutering. So how how does that occur? Well, not. <laughs> right. Right. Um, if a dog um, or a cat is not spayed or neutered when they come in, they get an appointment made right away, and they only get adopted out when they're spayed and neutered. And I think this is, um, people are, are catching on to spaying and neutering their, their pets. And um, I, I looked at the numbers earlier at how many dogs we adopted out. And in 2008, it was 302. And now we're down to like between 100 and, yeah, around 130. It doesn't mean we, I mean, we adopt out less, but we have less dogs, which means I think the spaying and neutering is catching on and that's why we're getting less dogs in. So yeah, very important, spay and neuter your pets. Right, yeah, with the population growth in, in Parkville and then seeing the numbers go down, something is at work there and uh, it would be really, yeah, nice to, to think that it's that, so. Um, we have a question here. On your farmer's market, um, is it all food that is grown there or do you bring some in? That's a great question. Um, will, you re will you recap the question for a second? Sure. Uh, the question is, at our farmer's market on Wednesday, from 2 to 6, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, is it all our food that's available, or do we have some that's grown elsewhere? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah.
you can order everything early starting Monday at about noon. Make it really, really easy. I mean, they, you can drive up, you don't even have to get out of your car sometimes. Yeah, you don't even have to get out of your car. So uh, pay online or pre-order, zip by, just 10 minutes down the road here from here in Parkville. Awesome. Um, we got another question here in the audience. Yeah, it's Bonnie, right? Yes. Um, I have heard anecdotally that a lot of seniors in the last year out of fear of COVID have opted to stay home instead of going to an assisted living facility. Is there anyone you can recommend that is a, that is a personal resource to maybe look at the situation and make sure they're connected with what they need that folks can turn to? Okay, so the question is with COVID over the past year and the seniors who are living alone at home and maybe in isolation, is there anybody that that senior can reach out to or that the yeah, or their children or a family member can talk to, to make kind of sure assess whether they need whether they can say for them to stay at home any further or whether they have the resources they need or um you know there it, it depends on the situation and kind of um, what factors are bubbling in that life um, a good place to start is always with the uh, senior center the um, platte county senior center or the Northland Shepherd Center. They have social workers, they have case managers, they can all help out. Um, I am happy to help direct. I work with vet houses, uh, there's six of them. Um, not everybody is a fit for vet house and for many reasons, but I'm happy and I spend a lot of time just conferring with people and helping connect them to who it is they need. So it may be somebody, you know, what we what we have found, frankly, in the last month or so, now that people are really coming back out again to look um, to the to look maybe for the first time, um, now that they know that they can come and go and they can have visitors, is a lot of people who are out shopping for their senior community have declined greatly to the point where they might be see their needs may exceed what they can even get in assisted living. They might be needing memory care or get skilled care. That type of assessment will happen when you're touring, when you're meeting and visiting. Um, but if anybody has any questions, they can also just, you know, feel free to contact me. And I forgot to mention, I've got this booklet, it's called The Confident Caregiver, that has a lot of great information on how to kind of assess the situation and uh, including how to assess your own situation as caregiver if you are exceeding your limitations in energy and physical ability to care for somebody, how do you know and where do you turn? So um, I guess the, I'll try to make the, the shortest answer to your question is call me and I'll connect you. Otherwise, start with your community with the health uh, uh, senior services in fact. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here that I, I wanted to ask and to go across and, and get an answer from, from each of you. And it, and it, it, it may take a different form as, as each answer. Um, but it started off with the question I wanted to ask Alicia. And then I found myself wanting to ask Bonnie and as well as Julia. And that's what framework guides your direction as you're building this organization, as you're creating this web what what are you, what are you leaning on? How 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 do you uh, I guess stay on the path? So I think I have it easy because we all connect through food. It's like the most basic of things. We all have food. If we're lucky, we all need food every day. So um, and I've always fed people. So I wait tables, you know, I worked in melon fields when I was a kid, and then I don't know that that's a very inspired answer, but I think that it's, uh, it's just simple, it's simple food, and that's how we I love it. No, and that that's perfect, right? I, I tend to overcomplicate things in my mind, but it, it sounds so true when you just say it's simple, it's about food, and that's really awesome. Thank you. And, and Bonnie, I guess when, when I was thinking about the caregiving, I was thinking about coping and burnout, right? And how, 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 do you, how does that path, you know, again, how do you stay on that path with all those competing? Okay, so as a caregiver, how do you stay on the caregiving path? 
Yeah, or how, yeah, how do you, for the, for the caregiving with, in terms of coping and burnout, right? That's the path, right? And, and to, to avoid those so you can continue that relationship. Yes. Well, I think that one of the most significant things a caregiver needs to recognize is that this can be a very, very, very long road. I mean, people in their 60s and even 50s are getting Alzheimer's now. And um, it can be a very, very long road. So you cannot run sprint for your entire life. It's really important, first of all, as a caregiver, if you don't already have strong support from other family members and friends or church or whoever else, is to reach out and to create a support group. And many churches all could help you with that. Again, I'm going to go back to the Platt County Senior Center and Northland Shepherd Center. Um, they all have support groups that they can help right. you connect to. So I think that's important because they're going to do the important work with you of helping you identify and quantify. Part of it is in here, too. How you can really quantify how much time and energy and exertion you are expending and how long can you really do that. Um, statistically, caregivers get sick and die earlier than the person they're caring for. Wow. And that's typically, you know, for a spouse who's caring for another, but I've seen even, you know, kids who are in their 70s caring for parents in their 90s and they're not taking care of themselves, they're not taking exercise, they're not going to the doctors, they're stressed out. They're having strokes. So get yourself a good, good support system. And That's hopefully awesome. it's your family and your friends, but if, if you don't have that available, do a support group. Awesome. And, and it, you know, in, in terms of the faux pas, I, I heard so much change and growth. And so the question, I guess, is where where is faux pas going to be in five years and 10 years? Uh, you know, I, I didn't hear anything about the raccoons or possums that are running around here. Right. Yeah, I don't know if that's on your uh, on your agenda <laughs> well, for, for growth or... or well, where- actually, we did have goats at some point, two goats that we adopted out and horses and uh, sheep. They weren't at the shelter. <laughs> but... Um, well, I, I think we're, we're just going to keep going what we're doing and um, for the animals of, of, the, of the area. And um, I kind of highlighted all the, the positive things, but um, you mentioned the burnout. And it's, it's not the cats and the dogs that make us burn out or make us question things. It's the people. Because we get dogs in because... Of, oh, we're moving tomorrow. Can can we bring our dog? Uh, we're getting a divorce. We need to get rid of the cat. And it's like, it would be much easier if it w- wasn't for people sometimes. <laughs> and um, but we're in this for the animals. So so we pull through. And and I hope in in five and ten years we're still here going strong with volunteers because we're we're all volunteers. We're we're not getting paid to do this. And um, so I'm hoping we keep finding volunteers who are dedicated and, and, and keep this up with us. Awesome. To be foster to yeah. become a, a doctor or, or? Not, no. Um, the recap of the question. Um, he asked if you have to foster in order to adopt. I, I'm kind of rephrasing it a little bit. Um, sometimes we have foster failures. People take a dog to foster, but then they fall in love. I'm like, we can't let this dog go. We, we're adopting it. But um, what we do is when people adopt a dog, we have a, a two-week trial period. It is called foster to adopt. And during that two weeks, because dogs are like people. Sometimes you don't get along with each other. Dogs don't get along with the other dog in the household. They, they can't get used to the kids. I mean, there, there are so many things that could go wrong. So it's kind of like a trial period. And when the people decide it's not going to work out after a week, they get half the adoption fee back. Um, So, so it is kind of fostering and adopting, but not really, if that makes sense. And then what's, I don't know if that's right, but like how many adoptions a year? So the dogs, um, on average, the last couple of years, we had 129 adopted out. This year so far, we had 45. And um, we always take our dogs back. It doesn't matter if, not just after this trial period, but 
down the road, the person dies or they move. I mean, so, some reasons I don't understand why people give up their dogs, but it's not uh, for us to ask, why are you doing it? We don't want to make the p people feel bad. We just want the dog to be safe. So it can be a year down the road. It can be 10 years down the road. The dog is always a family member of faux pas mm -hmm. or in the cat. <laughs> I always say dogs because I'm, I, I'm on the dog side, the dogs and the cats. And the goats, I guess, too. <laughs> so. All right. Well, uh, not seeing any other questions. I, I just want to wrap up. I think we've had a great. Oh, yeah, we've got one more coming in. Is Popa still looking to build another shelter, or is the city of Parkville letting you stay at the current property? We are staying at the current property. Okay, well, um, that was very engaging. I did hear things that I'm glad I wasn't in one breakout room for, and I really appreciate your time and you guys bringing all of yourselves and your organizations to this meeting, to this forum. And, and you know, I, 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 again, I've been in this city for, in this town for many years, and I still learn something new every time I, I have one of these and I hear from people. And, and, for me, it always comes back to relationships, whether it's with the food, with the land, with our families, with our animals. Um, that's the simple answer. I, I over talk, I overthink, but I think it comes down to relationships. And uh, we have three amazing examples of organizations that foster and build and grow those relationships. And what happens after that is is a miracle. It's it, Nobody can tell what that's going to be. It just happens. And so... Um, so yeah, so those are the parting words for today. Um, normally, I don't have to do the closing because I'm running, I'm running a breakout room, but I, I just wanted to say thank you all for tuning in. Again, thank you to um, our speakers, our volunteers, our attendees. Um, the Parkville Living Center is trying to do something new. We're trying to bring people together in a, relation, in a relational way. So um, if you like what you're seeing, if you want to engage, if you want to participate or learn more. If you have ideas about ways to be in community that you're not quite sure how to take that next step, that's exactly what we're doing here. And as you can see, we don't have the answers at the Parkville Living Center, but we make the connections and um, we hope to be that connection for you. So uh, stop on by, check us out, check out these amazing organizations. There's a survey on our website that you can fill out that tells informs us on how to better these town hall surveys or these town hall forums. So um, if you have a minute, please check out those, uh, that survey and complete that. And uh, again, everything we do here is free. It's donation based. So um, don't be shy. Come on down and uh, participate in, in being in relationship, food, elderly care animals, or just community. So with that, I will end and uh, have a good night. <laughs>